Chapter 7 Maestro's Fall Jalaxel, the leader of Bregan Dirth, sees membership in the Lord's Alliance as his path to power beyond Luskan. As the secret lord of a city with an unsavory reputation, he has a hard time getting a seat at the table with other cities of the north when it comes to trade and defense of the region. Thus, he plans to use the stolen gold to bargain with Lairil Silverhand for inclusion in the alliance, and to oust Neverwinter and its lord to Galt Neverember, Jalaxel's fiercest political opponent, from the group. Facing Jalaxel As the characters investigate the Sea Maiden's Fair, they could run into Jalaxel, especially if they take a kick-in-the-door approach and storm the vessel of the traveling carnival. When Jalaxel learns that the characters are aboard one of his ships, he arranges to meet with them in the guise of Zardos Zord. If they refuse, Jalaxel orders his crew to cast the characters overboard, or takes care of the job himself if he must. If he thinks the adventurers can be trusted, Jalaxel proposes that they join his search for the Vault of Dragon. He intends to return the gold to Lairil Silverhand, less 5,000 gold pieces for the characters in exchange for their help. He offers another 5,000 gold pieces for their help in recovering the Dragon Staff of Akirian. If the characters accept, Jalaxel upholds his end of the agreement. Once the gold is secure, he gives the characters their cut. If the characters do not agree with Jalaxel's terms, or they assault him, he tries to knock them unconscious and leave them without clothes or equipment in the gutter of the dock ward. He stores their equipment in Area J-16 aboard the Eye Catcher, with the exception of any magic items. Those he stashes in Area U-4 aboard the Scarlet Marpanoth, his secret submarine. In the unlikely event that Jalaxel is killed, Bregan Dirth raises him from the dead within a 10-day. Once he's back in action, he tries to recover any gear that was stolen from him. Disrupting Jalaxel's operation Characters can hinder Jalaxel in the ways described in the following two sections. Destroy the figureheads. The figureheads on Jalaxel's ships, as described in Area J-8, create illusions around Drow crew members, making them appear human. If a figurehead is destroyed, the drow on that ship remain below decks to ensure that they don't draw unwanted attention. Sink or steal a vessel. If the characters sink or steal one of his sailing ships, or the Scarlet Marpanoth, Jalaxel tasks his crew members with finding out what went wrong. In the case of a sunken ship, such wanton destruction could also involve the city watch, especially if the act results in people drowning. Sea Maiden's Fair Jalaxel Banray's seafaring carnival travels up and down the Sword Coast in three ships. The Eyecatcher, Jalaxel's flagship, is ostentatious. Mounted underneath is the Scarlet Marpanoth, a submarine of Lantanese design. The second ship, the Heartbreaker, is primarily used to transport performers, strange creatures, and wagons. The third ship, the Hellraiser, transports musicians and decorative floats. The Heartbreaker and the Hellraiser are presently docked while the Eyecatcher is anchored in the harbour. All three ships are crewed by drow who are magically disguised to appear human. Despite their disguises, the drow still have the sunlight sensitivity trait. Approaching the ships The Heartbreaker and the Hellraiser are docked across from each other at the same pier in the dock ward. The characters need only walk up a ramp from the pier to area J1 on either ship. The pier is so busy that no one takes notice of the characters until they are on a vessel. Jalaxel's flagship is anchored in Deepwater Harbour, a mile away from his other ships. To reach the eyecatcher, the characters must travel there by using another vessel, by swimming or by flying. If the characters approach in a vessel known to the crew, such as a rowboat from another of Jalaxel's ships, the characters arouse no suspicion until they are seen on deck. The crew of the Eyecatcher sends word to Jalaxel immediately if the characters approach in an unknown vessel. If the characters approach the Eyecatcher in an underwater vehicle, such as Grindagarloth's apparatus of Coalish, as described in Chapter 4, 
The character's piloting must succeed on a DC-12 dexterity stealth check to keep the vehicle from being spotted by the crew of the Scarlet Marpanoth. If the character is approached by swimming, each of them must succeed on a DC-10 dexterity stealth check to avoid being spotted by a crew of the eyecatcher. Crews The characters can learn valuable information by interrogating crew members and carnival performers. Ship Captains Although Zardos Zord, Jalaxel Banray's alter ego, commands the fleet, each ship has its own captain, a Bragan Dirth Drow mage disguised as a slender, well-dressed human. These captains know of Jalaxel's plans. They communicate with each other and with Jalaxel by way of sending spells, which they prepare instead of fly. Velgos of Fezrin captains the Hellraiser in the guise of a human named Fergus Crabwater. He enjoys wine a little too much, and the characters have advantage on charisma checks made to interact with him during a meal. Tylan the Wept captors the Heartbreaker as a human named Kla Basham. He's a humorless taskmaster whose tarantula familiar is always on his shoulder. Loraf Farn captains the Eye Catcher as a human named Tarwind Arahook. He loves games of chance and can't resist a good wager. A successful DC-15 Charisma, Deception or Persuasion check, and the mention of Zardos Zod's name, is enough to gain an audience with a ship captain. If the characters capture one of the captains, and succeed on a DC-15 Charisma Intimidation check, they learn the following information by asking the right questions. The Sea Maiden's Fair and all of its ships are under the command of Zardos Zord of Luskan, a ship's captain won't divulge Zord's true identity unless magically compelled to do so. Zord has a cabin aboard the Eyecatcher and spends a lot of time there with Margot Verida and Kefeta Merzan, two of the fair's star performers. A year ago, the Sea Maiden's Fair visited the island nation of Latan, where Zord acquired a submarine called the Scarlet Marpanoth. The submarine is mounted underneath the eyecatcher. Zord has operatives searching for an artifact called the Stone of Galore, which leads to a place called the Vault of Dragons. For security reasons, the captains aren't kept informed of the mission's progress. Zord has drow spies in Waterdeep, Felrek Lafine, Kreb Masklier, and Solon Zindabras all carry Lantanese firearms. Our disguises are powered by a magical figurehead fixed to the fore of each ship. Sailors The Eyecatcher, the Heartbreaker, and the Hellraiser are crewed by 20 sailors each. Three drow elite warriors, mates, and 17 drow, all magically disguised as slender humans aboard their vessels. All loyal members of Bregan Dearth, and all know that Zardos Zord is Jalaxel Banneray in disguise. They know nothing about the Scarlet Marpanoth or Jalaxel's plans. The crew has orders not to fraternize with strangers or guests. Characters who question crew members can learn the following. Zardos Zord is a member of the Sea Maiden's Fair. If you want to meet with him, speak to a ship captain. A sailor won't divulge Zord's true identity unless magically compelled to do so. The Sea Maiden's Fair is based out of Luskan. Carnies. Most of the carnival performers and workers are human commoners, trained to perform a handful of tasks or stunts. Performers have proficiency in the performance skill. They're kept in the dark about most things, but they're not oblivious. With a successful DC-10 charisma check, a character can control or trick a carny into revealing one of the following pieces of information. Zada Zord uses magic to get from the eye catcher to other boats. I've never seen him in a rowboat. The sailors communicate with each other using odd hand signals. Members of Bregan Dearth use drow sign language. All sailors have an aversion to sunlight. Have you ever noticed that the sailors have a slightest hint of an elvish accent? All the crew members are men. Very odd. Discovering the drow. Any character who spends one hour observing a ship's crew can make a DC-15 Wisdom Perception check. With a successful check, a character notices that most crew members speak common with an elvish accent, 
and exchange hand signals when they think no one's looking. A drow character recognizes the hand signals as drow sign language. The changes wrought by the magic of the ship's figureheads, as described in Area J8, fail to hold up to physical inspection, meaning that the characters who interact with the crew members have a chance to notice the illusion. For example, a character who grabs the sailors by the ears would quickly realize that by touch the ear is pointed, not rounded as it appears. Additionally, any drow characters who board one of these ships instantly takes on the illusionary form of a human of the same gender, height, and weight because of the ship's magic figurehead. Ship's Features Each ship has the statistics of a sailing ship, as described in Airborne and Waterborne Vehicles in Chapter 5 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, as well as the features described in the following subsections. Owning a Ship At some point in your campaign, the adventurers might gain custody of a ship. They might purchase or capture one, or receive one to carry out a mission. It's up to you whether a ship is available for purchase, and you have the power to deprive the adventurers of a ship at any time should it become a nuisance, as described in the shipwreck sidebar. Crew A ship needs a crew of skilled hirelings to function. As per the player's handbook, one skilled hireling costs at least two gold pieces per day. The minimum number of skilled hirelings needed to crew a ship depends on the type of vessel, as shown in the airborne and waterborne vehicles table. You can track the loyalty of individual crew members or the crew as a whole using the optional loyalty rules in Chapter 4. If at least half the crew becomes disloyal during a voyage, the crew turns hostile and stages a mutiny. If the ship is berthed, Disloyal crew members leave the ship and never return. Passengers The table indicates the number of small and medium passengers the ship can accommodate. Accommodations consist of shared hammocks in tight quarters. A ship outfitted with private accommodations can carry one-fifth as many passengers. A passenger is usually expected to pay five silver pieces per day for a hammock, but prices can vary from ship to ship. A small private cabin usually costs two gold pieces per day. Cargo The table indicates the maximum tonnage each kind of ship can carry. Damage Threshold A ship has immunity to all damage unless it takes an amount of damage equal to or greater than its damage threshold, in which case it takes damage as normal. Any damage that fails to meet or exceed the damage threshold is considered superficial and doesn't reduce the ship's hit points. Ship Repair Repairs to a damaged ship can be made while the vessel is berthed. Repairing one hit point of damage requires one day and costs 20 gold pieces for materials and labor. Alarms If intruders are detected or a fight breaks out on one of the ships, the entire crew, one drow mage captain, three drow elite warriors, and 17 drow, mobilize to combat the threat. The drow prefer to take captives or render enemies unconscious rather than kill them. Captives are thrown into the brig, in area J15, until Jalaxel decides what to do with them. Their gear is stowed in the armory, in area J16. Ceilings Cabins, holds, and passageways have 8 foot high ceilings with 6 foot high doorways connecting them. Doors Unless otherwise noted, Doors are made of wood. A door's lock can be picked by a character who makes a successful DC 15 dexterity check using thieves tools, or a door can be forced open by a character who makes a successful DC 15 strength athletics check. A ship's captain has keys to all locked doors aboard his vessel. Elevator platforms. Each ship is equipped with an elevator platform that can be lowered and raised with a lever to make loading and unloading cargo easier. When not in use, this platform stays in the lowest cargo hold of each ship. See the description of the cargo holds for more information. Lighting Areas below decks are brightly lit by hanging lanterns. Rigging Rigging can be climbed without an ability check. Areas of the ships The Eyecatcher, the Heartbreaker, and the Hellraiser have the same general configuration and occupants. Corresponding to map 1.7, 
Exceptions are noted in the area's description and on the map. Area J1, Main Deck. Three sailors, Drow, and a mate, a Drow Elite Warrior, are on deck at all times. If the characters board the ship and ask to speak with the captain, the mate asks their business before even thinking about disturbing him. Jolly Boats. Four rowboats are stacked on top of each other on this deck. Ropes and pulleys are used to hoist these boats in and out of the water. Area J2. Storage. The smell of tar permeates this cluttered cabin, which contains the following features. Barrels of tar are secured to nets on the starboard wall below mounted tools. Against the port wall, tight rolls of white canvas are stacked atop each other and secured with rope. Area J3. Mate's Cabin. This cabin has the following features. Twin hammocks hang perpendicular to one another. Two off-duty mates, drow elite warriors, relax in the hammocks. Three walnut chests sit under the hammocks. The chests are unlocked. Treasure. Each chest holds two sets of common clothes, a water skin filled with wine, and a pouch containing 3d6 gold pieces and 4d10 silver pieces. Area J4. Crew Cabins. Each of these cabins holds four hammocks. One off-duty sailor, a drow, rests in each cabin. Area J5. Galley. Heat and savoury scents burst from this cramped cavern, which contains the following features. A busy cook, a commoner, works a fry pan with one hand and stirs a pot with the other over a small stove. Dirty dishes are stacked in a wash bin. A table holds food in various states of preparation. The cook is too busy to speak with characters and is quick to holler an alarm if attacked, drawing the attention of the crew. Area J6, the pantry. Secured to the walls are racks of cooking ingredients, including jars of spices, sacks of flour, and casks of lard. Area J7, the dining cabin. The crew dines here throughout the day, at any given time, the cabin contains the following. Six sailors, drow, are enjoying a meal. Aboard the Heartbreaker or the Hellraiser, the sailors are joined by 1d4 carnies, commoners. Furnishings include a table, ten stools, and two oak cabinets containing dishes, tankards, and utensils. Area J8. Forecastle. The forecastle is within sight of the sailors on the main deck, in area J1, the aft castle lower deck in area J9, and the aft castle upper deck in area J11. Figurehead. A gilded wooden figurehead of a female elf with flowing hair sticks out from the ship's prow, reaching forth with both hands. Since the figurehead is unpainted, there is no way to tell if it depicts a drow, but a character who inspects the figurehead closely and succeeds on a DC-30 Wisdom Perception check, notices tiny embossed spiders on its forehead. A detect magic spell, or similar magic, reveals an aura of illusion magic around the figurehead, the effect that makes every drow aboard the ship appear as human. A drow's gender, height, and weight are unchanged. The illusion affects only appearance, not voices or mannerisms. Casting dispel magic on a disguised drow causes the illusion around it to wink out only for a moment. An anti-magic field suppresses the figurehead's magic within the field's area. Destroying the figurehead ends the effect throughout the ship. A figurehead has an armor class of 15, with 50 hit points, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. Area J9, Aft Castle Lower Deck. This deck has the following features. Two sailors, drow, are here at all times. Stairs to the port and starboard climb to the aft castle upper deck in area J11 and the captain's wheel. Anchor. The ship's anchor is accessed from this deck. It can be raised or lowered by one creature in 10 rounds, or one minute, by two creatures in five rounds, by three creatures in three rounds, or by four creatures in one round. Area J10. The captain's cabin. Regardless of which ship the characters are on, this opulent cabin contains the following features. 
Stylish purple drapes cover large windows that look out over the harbour. To one side of the central pillar rests a comfortable bed, its oak headboard carved to resemble a kraken. An oak dining table surrounded by six high-backed chairs rests on the opposite side of the central pillar. Other furnishings include a glass-doored cabinet containing several shelves of books, a wooden trunk sealed with a padlock, and a small writing desk. Captain Each ship's captain, a drow mage, can usually be found here, with a nimble right acting as an attendant and a bodyguard. A captain is happy to meet with characters who ask to speak with him, mostly to gauge if they pose a threat. If the characters are polite, the captain invites them to join him for a meal. If the characters grow tiresome or threatening, he commands them to leave the ship at once, sounding an alarm if they refuse. Fastened to each captain's belt is a ring holding a number of keys. One key unlocks the trunk in this cabin, the other keys unlock any locked doors on the captain's ship. Book Cabinet Each captain keeps a modest collection of mundane books. Each hides his spellbook in a secret space under the bottom shelf, which can be found with a successful DC 14 Wisdom Perception check. The spellbook contains the following spells. Cone of Cold Control Water Counterspell Detect Magic Fireball Fly Greater Invisibility, Ice Storm, Mage Armor, Magic Missile, Misty Step, Rary's Telepathic Bond, Sending, Shield, Suggestion, Thunder Wave, Water Breathing, and Web. Locked Trunk. A successful DC-20 dexterity check by a character using Thieves Tools opens the padlock, or it can be broken off with a successful DC-20 Strength Athletics check. The trunk contains folded clothes, 250 gold pieces in a sack, 1d6 pearls worth 100 gold pieces each in a silk pouch, a potion of water breathing, and a bottle of excellent wine worth 25 gold pieces, bearing a label in the shape of an eye patch and the name One-Eyed Jacks in common. Area J11, the aft castle upper deck. This highest deck of the ship is within sight of the forecastle in area J8, the main deck in area J1, and the aft castle lower deck in area J9. It has the following features. The ship's wheel stands atop the deck. Two sailors, drow, are stationed here at all times. Wheel. If the ship is sailing with a full crew, a character who has proficiency with water vehicles can stand at the wheel and steer the vehicle. Area J12, Upper Cargo Hold. This hold contains the following features. Large grilled doors in the ceiling open to allow goods to be moved to and from this hold using the cargo elevator. A 15 foot by 10 foot section of floor opens to reveal the lower cargo hold of Area J17 aboard the Eyecatcher or the Hellraiser and Area J19 aboard the Heartbreaker. Crates and barrels stacked to the ceiling are tied down to ensure they don't move. These containers hold food and water for the crew and the carnies. Cargo Elevator To activate an elevator platform, a creature must stand on the platform and use an action to pull a lever up or down. The platform can't be raised higher than the main deck in Area J1 or lower deeper than the ship's lowest cargo hold. The trap door in the floor opens when the cargo elevator is raised. If the platform is raised to area J1, the trap door remains open until the elevator platform returns to this area, or area J17, or J19 on the hardbreaker. Area J13, the head. The reek of urine fills this cramped head, privies, each little more than a bench seat with a hole open to the water below are his room's only features. Area J14, Carney's Cabins. Eight narrow cabins are fitted with hammocks, each of which holds a resting carnival performer or worker, commoner. Carnies call for help when they are confronted by intruders and fight only in self-defense. Area J15, Brig. A door made of crisscrossing iron bars and fitted with a sturdy lock seals off this cabin. 
whose only feature is a chamber pot. The captain carries a key to the door. The lock can be picked by a character who makes a successful DC-17 dexterity check using thieves tools, made with disadvantage from inside the cell. A successful DC-23 strength athletics check forces the door open. The door has an armor class of 19, a damage threshold of 10, 27 hit points, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. Jailed Sailor There's a 25% chance that a Sailor Drow is being held in the brig after punching a crewmate during an argument. Otherwise, the cells are empty. Area J16 The Armory The Drow store their weapons and armor here while the ship is at sea. If the characters are captured and stripped of their equipment, their non-magical belongings are stowed here. The cabin has the following features. Empty weapon racks and armor hooks line the wall. Stairs lead down into the ship's belly. Safe. Eyecatcher only. The armory aboard the eyecatcher also features a 750 pound cast iron safe with a combination lock. Jalaxel and his lieutenants Felrek Lafine, Kreb Maskelier, and Solon Zindabris know the combination. 1, 20, 59. A character can pick the lock with a successful DC-25 dexterity investigation check using thieves tools. Each attempt takes one minute. A knock spell or similar magic also opens the safe, which contains three pistols, 12 leather packets of smoke powder, three leather pouches containing 20 bullets, and 250 gold pieces in a sack. Stairs. The stairs lead to area J17 on the Eyecatcher or the Hellraiser, or to area J20 on the Heartbreaker. Area J17, lower cargo hold, only on the Eyecatcher and Hellraiser. The fantastical floats of the Sea Maiden's Fair are broken down and kept in the lower cargo hold of the Hellraiser while the eyecatcher holds pieces of broken experimental floats. See area J19 for a description of the Heartbreaker's lower cargo hold. Cargo Elevator If the cargo elevator platform is lowered to this area while creatures are in the 15 by 10 foot space while the platform lands, each of those creatures must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or take 11 or 2d10 bludgeoning damage and be knocked prone and restrained until the platform is raised. A creature that succeeds on its saving throw moves to a space of its choice next to the elevator platform without provoking attacks of opportunity. Hellraiser's Hold The hold of the Hellraiser is mostly cleaned out on days when parades are scheduled, except for empty storage trunks. On other days it contains the following paraphernalia. Various trunks filled with musician, dancer, acrobat, and clown costumes. Casks holding confetti, glitter, and body paint. Bundles of wooden stilts, four and eight feet high. Paper mache beholders mounted atop ten-foot poles. A float topped by a life-size mechanical unicorn, ridden by a mechanical drow ranger, waving two scimitars. When a lever under the float is pulled, the unicorn farts a 15-foot cone of confetti, which it can do twice before needing to be refilled. A float topped with two mechanical goblins that repeatedly punch each other when wound up. A float bearing a mechanical armored knight battling a mechanical pit fiend. When wound up, the knight cleaves with its sword while the devil flaps its wings. Deflated black, blue, green, red, and white dragon balloons. They float magically when filled with air, and their size is huge while inflated. An enormous Tarask puppet for five puppeteers. Wagons covered and decorated with tassels, and painted with colourful patterns and creatures. Horse and ox harnesses, all brightly decorated. The Eyecatcher's Hold The aft section of the hold of the Eyecatcher is guarded by four giant spiders, painted in bright colours. These arachnids have been trained by Jalaxel since they were hatchlings, and they can pass themselves off as inanimate float decorations by remaining perfectly still until they attack. They aren't hostile towards Drow, whose true nature they sense despite the ship's illusion magic. Characters who have a passive Wisdom Perception score of 17 or higher 
realize the spiders are a threat before the creatures attack. All sorts of damaged and unfinished attractions are stored here, including the following. A number of broken clockwork monsters, half-completed or broken wagon covers and puppets, a deflated balloon of an oversized flump that has a small gash in it, a mending cantrip can repair the damage, an undecorated float topped with an unpainted mechanical gold dragon made of canvas stretched over a wooden frame. Rigged with glass canisters of flammable gas, the mechanical gold dragon is designed to breathe fire when a lever is pulled. Pulling the lever cracks the canisters and sets the dragon on fire. If the fire breaks out here and isn't extinguished promptly, it spreads to other part of the hold after one minute. Crew members in other parts of the ship detect smoke five minutes later, by which time the hold is a raging inferno. Crew members will focus on saving the submarine, if it's still attached before abandoning ship. Area J18 Craft Supplies Eye Catcher and Hellraiser only Each of these cabins contains materials used to decorate the floats. Glitter, feathers, fabric, paper, scissors, sewing needles, spools of coloured thread, and flasks of glue are strewn over small tables. Schematics for parade floats are tacked onto the walls alongside various tools. Area J19 Lower Cargo Hold In the Heartbreaker only Beastly odours fill the hold of the Heartbreaker, becoming stronger as the characters get closer to the creature pens in Area J20. The hold is mostly empty on parade days. On other days it contains disassembled wagons, axle wheels and cages that are used to pull exotic creatures through crowded streets. Tools needed to assemble and repair the wagons hang from hooks on the walls. Cargo Elevator If the cargo elevator platform is lowered to this area while creatures are in the 15 by 10 foot space while the platform lands, each of those creatures must succeed on a DC-10 dexterity saving throw or take 11 2d10 bludgeoning damage and be knocked prone and restrained until the platform is raised. A creature that succeeds on its saving throw moves to a space of its choice next to the elevator platform without provoking opportunity attacks. Area J20 Creature Pens In the Heartbreaker Only this section of the hold reeks of animal musk and waste. While they're not being paraded through a city street in caged wagons, these monstrous attractions of the Sea Maiden's Fair growl, chortle, stamp, snort, and roll in closed stalls. Two handlers, commoners with proficiency in animal handling, walk from stall to stall, carrying buckets of food and speaking softly to the creatures. Each pen is effectively a cell equipped with a sliding door that can be double latched from the outside. A wagon assembled in area J19 can be backed up to any pen, with the pen doors open. A successful DC-15 wisdom animal handling check then coaxes a caged creature from the back of the wagon. This check is made with advantage if food is given to the creature. If the check fails by five or more, the creature escapes panics and begins attacking indiscriminately as it tries to win its freedom. Any such ruckus alerts the animal handlers or other crew members if they are nearby. The following creatures are kept in the 12 pens. Two apes, one rhinoceros, one tiger, one allosaurus, two panthers, one owlbear, four giant fire beetles, one hippogriff, one axe beak, two death dogs, one giant vulture, and one polar bear. The death dogs and the giant vulture are evil, and the giant vulture can understand common, though it can't speak. They seize any chance to escape and revel in the suffering of other creatures. Area J21, the handler's cabin, in the heartbreaker only. This cabin contains hammocks for the two handlers who work in Area J20. If the creatures have been taken on parade, the handlers are asleep in their hammocks. Area J22 Beast Supplies in the Heartbreaker Only The supplies and food for the creatures in Area J20 are stored here. 
Haunches of meat hang from the ceiling that give this cabin a sickly sweet scent. Shovels, ropes, chains, buckets, bales of hay, and several large crates are pushed against the walls. The crates hold a variety of lichens, mosses, and fungi that are fed to the herbivorous creatures. A successful DC-20 intelligence nature check identifies the vegetation as native to the Underdark, and the haunches of animal meat as deep growth, an ox-like creature raised for its meat by drow in the Underdark. Area J-23, Gunslinger's Hold, Heartbreaker and Hellraiser only. No one is allowed down here without the captain's permission, and the guards have ordered to kill trespassers on sight. This area contains the following features. Two drow gunslingers stand guard outside area J27. The hold is filled with barrels containing ale and fresh water. The barrels are held down by cargo nets hooked to the floor. Drow gunslingers. The drow take cover behind the walls that divide the area as they shoot. They fight to the death to keep intruders from reaching area J27. Area J24, Cleaning Supplies. These closets hold mops, brushes, buckets, and soap used for scrubbing the decks. Area J25, Gunslinger's Cabins. Heartbreaker and Hellraiser only. These two cabins are quarters of the Drow Gunslingers in Area J23. Each contains the following features. A hammock hangs on the wall opposite the door. A wooden mannequin and a walnut chest rest against the wall by the door. The mannequins double as armor racks, though no armor currently adorns them. Treasure Each chest holds two sets of common clothes, a water skin filled with wine, and a pouch containing 3d6 gold pieces and 4d10 silver pieces. Area J26 Lockers In the Heartbreaker and Hellraiser only. Lining this hall are eight closets used as storage lockers by the workers and performers of the Sea Maiden's Fair. They contain travelling clothes and outerwear hanging on hooks, as well as boots and shoes. Area J27, Smoke Powder Storage, in the Heartbreaker and Hellraiser only. The locked door to this forward cabin has a wooden sign nailed to the outside that reads in common and elvish, Restricted area. Do not enter. The room contains the following features. 20 wooden kegs are secured to the walls with ropes. Each keg has a paper label, written on which are the words, Smoke powder. Explosive. In common and elvish. A shelf above the kegs is lined with wooden boxes. Boxes. 10 wooden boxes on the shelf, each contain 100 pistol bullets. Kegs. Each keg holds five pounds of smoke powder. When one keg explodes, all other kegs within the area of effect explode as well. If half the kegs explode at once, the blast blows a hole in the forward hull, large enough to sink the ship. If all 20 kegs explode at once, the blast blows half the ship to smithereens, shattering windows throughout the dock ward and can be heard as far away as the field ward. Area J28 Walk-in Closets In the eye-catcher only. The doors to these closets are locked from the outside. Port Closet This closet abuts Jalaxel's cabin in Area J30 and contains tailored outfits and cloaks for every season and occasion, as well as towels. Against the back wall stands a wooden mannequin wearing an eye patch. A secret door along one wall can be detected with a successful DC-15 Wisdom Perception check. Starboard Closet This door abuts the guest cabin in Area J-29 and contains half a dozen gowns and two soft fur cloaks and hangers, ladies' hats on hooks, and fancy towels and shoes on shelves. A secret door along one wall can be detected with a successful DC-15 Wisdom Perception check. Area J29, the guest cabin in the eye catcher only. This richly appointed cabin is set aside for special guests. It contains a large bed, a wooden chest, a freestanding mirror, and a dresser with a lyre on top of it. 
Empty wine bottles roll back and forth across the floor as the ship moves. The bed holds three giggling figurines. Jalaxil Banre, in the guise of Zada's Zord, absent if he's marshalling in the Day of Wonders parade as described in the special events. Margot Verida, a human Amnian human bard. Kefeta Mazan, a female Mulhurundi human swashbuckler. Margot and Kefeta both joined the Sea Maidens' Fair within the past year. Margot is a lyrist, Kefeta as an acrobat. Jalaxil has taken a romantic interest in both women, who are also in love with each other. Margot and Kefeta are polite but terse, both are neutral good. If attacked, they grab their weapons and other belongings and flee through a secret door, as described further on. If separated from Jalaxil and compelled to divulge information about their host, Margot and Kefeta reveal some or all of the following facts. Zardot Zord is a drow named Jalaxil in disguise. Each ship in the Sea Maiden's Fair is crewed by drow. The ship's figureheads cast illusions on the drow, making them appear human. Jalaxil wants the Lord's Alliance to recognize his city, Luskan, as a new member, and he wants to push Neverwinter out of the Alliance. A year ago, the Sea Maiden's Fair visited the island nation of Lantern, where Jalaxil obtained a Lantanese submarine and several clockwork servants. Secret Door A secret door leading to a walk-in closet, as described in Area J28, can be found with a successful DC-15 Wisdom Perception check. Treasure Margot's lyre is worth 30 gold pieces. An unlocked chest at the foot of the bed holds four sets of costume clothing and a jewellery box containing six gold bracelets, worth 25 gold pieces each, two diamond rings worth 250 gold pieces each, and a pearl necklace worth 500 gold pieces. Area J30 Zada's Zord's Cabin, in the eye catcher only. The doors to this cabin are locked. If anyone other than Jalaxel turns the handle of either door, a magic mouth spell activates and shouts, By Loth's teeth, have you no manners? The sound is loud enough to be heard by Jalaxel if he is in area J29 and he comes to investigate. The room contains the following features. The sweet smell of lavender permeates the cabin. The scent is created by magic which can be dispelled. A nimble rite stands in a small alcove next to a chess table. An empty wine bottle on the table is labelled One-Eyed Jacks in common. Behind a purple curtain, a bed is covered by a soft blue blanket and matching pillows. Next to the bed is a wooden chest with clawed feet. Nimble rite the nimble rite serves Jalaxel as a servant and obeys its master's command without question. Absent orders, it attacks anyone who discovers the trap door in the floor as described further ahead. Secret Doors Any character who searches the cabin and succeeds on a DC-15 wisdom perception check finds a secret door leading to a walk-in closet in area J28 and a secret trap door in the floor. The trap door has an arcane lock spell cast on it, but rapping on it three times suppresses the spell for one minute. Alternatively, the trap door can be forced open with a successful DC 25 strength athletics check. Below the trap door, a metal ladder descends to the bottom of a 10 foot long, 3 foot diameter steel tube with a circular metal hatch at the bottom. The hatch is opened by turning its valve wheel which grants access to Area U1 on the Scarlet Marpanoth. This area is magically pressurized to keep water from entering the ship if the hatch is opened while the submarine is not docked. The chess set features jade pieces shaped like drow and is worth 2,500 gold pieces. Area J31, the training area in the eye catcher only. Jalaxel trains here regularly the space contains the following features. Ropes are strung throughout the area like webs. Four rapiers hang from a wooden rack attached to the mast. Five beat-up mannequins made of wood, straw and canvas stand about the room. Each holds a wooden sword and a wooden shield. A dartboard mounted to one wall has a shiny dagger sticking into it. 
attack mannequins. As a bonus action, Jalaxor can command five magic mannequins to animate and attack a single target of his choice. Each mannequin has the statistics of an animated armor. Mannequins that take damage become inanimate until Jalaxor uses another bonus action to reanimate them. A mannequin targeted by a mending cantrip regains one hit point. Dagger. The dagger in the dartboard is a plus one dagger. Ropes. The ropes make all parts of this area difficult to rein. As part of its movement, a creature can maneuver around the ropes with a successful DC 15 dexterity acrobatics check, negating the rope's effects for that creature until the end of its turn. Area J32, Jalaxel's sauna, in the eye catcher only. The door to this room is closed with an exterior hook latch. When the door is open, clouds of steam billow out from an area below. The steam is created magically and can be dispelled with a successful casting of Dispel Magic at a difficulty class of 14. The room holds only a wooden bench. Steam. The steam has no adverse effects for the first hour. For each additional hour spent in this room, a creature must succeed on a DC 11 constitution saving throw or gain one level of exhaustion. Creatures immune to fire damage automatically succeed on this save. The Scarlet Marpanoth Jalaxel Submarine, the Scarlet Marpanoth, is mounted underneath the eye catcher and can be only seen by creatures under the water. Jalaxel retreats here if the eye catcher comes under attack. Drow Crew The magic that conceals the true appearance of Jalaxel on board Jalaxel's ship doesn't extend to the Scarlet Marpanoth. Characters who encounter Drow while sneaking around the submarine are questioned. If the drow don't get answers they want, they attack. Any nearby drow who hear a fight break out will investigate and team up to repel the boarders. Gnome Engineers Rock gnome engineers maintain and operate the Scarlet Marpanoth. These gnomes are apprentice wizards with these changes. The gnomes are neutral good. They are small and have 7 or 2d6 hit points each. They have these racial traits. They have advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws against magic. Their walking speed is 25 feet. They have dark vision out to a range of 60 feet. They speak common and gnomish. The gnomes know a great deal about submarines and very little about anything else. They are treated well by Jalaxel, but a successful DC 15 charisma intimidation check, or a bribe of 100 gold pieces or more, can convince a gnome to surrender its master keys, tamper with the engine, or pilot the submarine as the characters direct. Submarine Features The Scarlet Marpanoth has an armor class of 20, 300 hit points, a damage threshold of 15, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. The submarine's structural integrity fails when the vessel drops to zero hit points, whereupon it floods and sinks. The submarine is worth 15,000 gold pieces intact and requires at least one pilot and one engineer to operate. It has a maximum speed of 2 miles per hour and can hold up to 10 passengers plus 2 tons of cargo. The submarine has the following features. Interior spaces are unlit. The drow and the gnomes rely on dark vision to see. All furnishings and features are bolted down. Chambers are 8 feet high with 6 foot high passages and doorways connecting them. Air magically circulates throughout a complex ventilation system and small metal grills set into the floor. Doors are made of steel and have an armor class of 19 with 27 hit points, a damage threshold of 10, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. A door's lock can be picked by a character who makes a successful DC 18 dexterity check using thieves' tools. A door can be forced open by a character who succeeds on a DC 25 strength athletics check. Jalaxel and the gnomes aboard the Scarlet Marpanoth have keys to all locked doors. All doors are airtight while closed. Areas of the Scarlet Marpanoth. The following locations are key to map 7.2. Area U1, the entrance hatch. Characters descending from Zardos Zord's cabin on the eye catcher in area J30 
arrive in this chamber. From this side, the circular metal hatch is opened by turning its valve wheel. This area is magically pressurized to keep water from entering the Scarlet Marpanoth if the hatch is opened while the submarine isn't docked to the eye catcher. But if both the outer hatch and the inner door are opened underwater, the submarine will flood. Area U2 The Engine Room The door to this area is locked. A plaque on the door reads Engine Room in common and gnomish. The room has the following features. The engine room is filled with machines that hiss, whir and clatter constantly. A rock gnome named Brina Bafflestone monitors the machinery at all times. Nearby is a copper speaking tube which enables her to communicate with the control room command center, area U7B. Drawers on the walls contain screwdrivers, wrenches and other tools. To port and starboard, three foot high, two and a half foot wide passageways lead deeper into the machinery. Medium creatures must squeeze to move through these passages. Machinery. The engine is a quasi-magical machine that controls the submarine's propulsion and depth and powers the fins and rudder that control direction. A detect magic spell or similar magic reveals an aura of transmutation magic throughout the area. A character who has proficiency in Tinkerer's tools can use the tools to disable the engine with a successful DC-15 intelligence check. The same check reactivates the disabled engine. Whether it succeeds or fails, each check represents 10 minutes of work. The engine can also be destroyed. It has an armor class of 16, with 50 hit points and immunity to poison and psychic damage. Area U3 Solon State Room If he has not been encountered and disposed of elsewhere, a drow gunslinger named Solon Zindabris is here, worshipping before a shrine of Lolth. His state room has the following features. The port alcove contains a net hammock and a steel footlocker. A black metal shrine of Lolth covered in tiny spider statuettes stands against one wall. At its top is a sculpture of the demon goddess, with the head and upper body of a female drow and the lower body of a spider. A lanternese diving suit hangs in a closet to the south. Diving suit. This experimental device consists of a pressure resistant padded suit made of canvas with iron fittings and iron gauntlets. A fishbowl helmet attaches to the suit's collar and functions as a cap of water breathing. Treasure. The shrine weighs 50 pounds and is worth 125 gold pieces as an art object. The footlocker contains a pouch holding 50 gold pieces and a potion of healing. The potion's crystal flask is shaped like a spider and is worth 25 gold pieces. Area U4, Jalaxel State Room. The door to this tidy cabin is locked. The cabin contains the following features. The scent of lavender magically permeates the cabin. The scent is created by magic and can be dispelled. A hammock is suspended in the starboard alcove. A detect magic spell or similar magic reveals that the wall behind the hammock radiates an aura of transmutation magic. Other furnishings include a tall harp with a stool nearby, a hapsichord with a matching bench, a freestanding mirror and a large wooden trunk. Closet The locked closet aft of the cabin contains a wooden rack stocked with 60 bottles of wine. Each one is a rare vintage worth 25 gold pieces. Magic Window Touching the wall behind the hammock renders the wall transparent from this side, and touching it again makes this window go away. When the wall is transparent, creatures in the cabin can see out, but the creatures outside the submarine can't see in. Wooden Trunk The trunk isn't locked. Lifting the lid causes panels on the front and sides to open, releasing a swarm of mechanical spiders that attack anyone other than Jalaxel. This swarm has statistics of a swarm of insects, spiders, with these changes. The swarm is made up of tiny constructs. It doesn't require air, food, drink or sleep. The swarm has vulnerability to lightning damage, is immune to exhaustion, and can't be charmed. Frightened, paralyzed, petrified, 
knocked prone or poisoned. The chest has a secret compartment in the bottom that can be detected and open with a successful DC-13 wisdom perception check. If Jalaxel has the Stone of Galore, he keeps it in the secret compartment, along with any magic items he might have claimed from the characters. The compartment is otherwise empty. Area U5, Felrec State Room. If he has not been encountered and defeated elsewhere, a drow gunslinger named Felrec Lafine is here cleaning his pistol. His stateroom contains a net hammock and a steel footlocker. Treasure. Felrec's footlocker contains 65 gold pieces in a pouch, a comb carved from a dragon bone, worth 5 gold pieces, and a pair of obsidian dice, worth 25 gold pieces. Area U6, Kreb's State Room. If he has not been encountered and defeated elsewhere, a drow gunslinger named Kreb Blasklia is here sharpening his sword. His stateroom contains a net hammock and nothing else. Area U7, Control Room. The control room has two levels, an observation deck in Area U7A and a command center in Area U7B, with two ladders running between levels. Two circular soundproof windows are embedded in the port and starboard bulkheads. The window panes are made of glass steel, a resilient metal magically rendered transparent. Curious merfolk who live in Deepwater Harbour investigate the submarine from time to time and might be seen peering through the windows. Area U7A, the observation deck. If Jalaxel Banray is forced to retreat to the submarine, he is here when the characters first arrive. The observation deck is an elevated 10 foot high metal platform with a grilled floor supported by two metal columns. Two padded swivel chairs are bolted to the deck, which is enclosed by a thin steel railing. The height of each chair can be adjusted to accommodate a small or medium creature. Between the two chairs is a bronze periscope that can be raised or lowered whenever the submarine is detached from the eye catcher. Area U7B, the command center. Three rock-gnomed engineers named Lorella Middenpump, Tavarround Waggletop, and Anverth Lefery are here on duty, along with two drow elite warriors named Carabel Lenz and Marrow Quazart. The drow guard the control room and keep the gnomes on task. Lorella sits in the pilot swivel chair, which is bolted to the floor and can be raised or lowered to accommodate a small or medium creature. The chair is situated before a panel of dials, levers and buttons. Tavarround and Averneth stand by the back wall, monitoring gauges and performing system checks. A copper speaking tube enables them to communicate with Brina Bafflestone in the engine room in Area U2. The gnomes can pilot the Scarlet Marpanoth without needing to make a check. Any other creature must succeed on a DC-20 intelligence check to figure out the controls. From the control panel, the pilot can detach the submarine from the eye catcher, as well as control its speed and direction and depth. The pilot can electrify the outer hull for one minute, after which the system requires one hour to recharge. Any creature that comes into contact with, or starts its turn in contact with the outer hull when it's electrified, must make a DC-15 dexterity check taking 22 or 40 10 lightning damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. A creature wearing metal armor has disadvantage on this saving throw. Area U8, the engineer's staterooms. Each of these four compartments contain an off-duty rock gnome engineer sleeping in a small hammock, beneath which are two steel footlockers. The four rock gnomes are named Cockerby Ficklestamp, Elliwick Fiddlefen, Gerbo Reese and Zafrab Hawkus Porcus. Footlockers. Each footlocker belongs to a particular gnome engineer stationed aboard the Scarlet Marpanoth. Both contain folded clothes sized for a gnome. One of them also holds a set of grease stained overalls and a set of tinkerer's tools that belong to the gnomes asleep in the bunk. There is a 25% chance that a footlocker also contains a clockwork toy a fire starter or a music box, 
as described in the Rock Gnome section of Chapter 2 of the Player's Handbook. Clockwork Toy This toy is a clockwork animal, monster or person such as a frog, mouse, bird, dragon or soldier. When placed on the ground, the toy moves 5 feet across the ground on each of your turns in a random direction. It makes noises as appropriate to the creature it represents. Firestarter The device produces a miniature flame which you can use to light a candle, a torch or campfire. Using the device requires your action. Music Box When opened, this music box plays a single song at a moderate volume. The box stops playing when it reaches the song's end or when it's closed. Area U9 The Dining Room This room has the following features. A walnut dining table is surrounded by eight padded swivel chairs. The height of each chair can be adjusted to accommodate a small or medium creature. Soft ambient music fills the room, created by magic. Area U10 The Gallery This room has the following features. An iron stove sits in one corner. In the opposite corner stands a steel food preparation table with utensils dangling above it. Built into the table is a lidded steel box attached to a pedal on the floor below. When the pedal is pumped, water and moving brushes scrub dishes and utensils that have been placed into the box. A cart holds cutlery and dishes. Area U11 The Pantry Metal shelves lining the walls hold fresh fruit, vegetables, casks of wine and meat. Two steel barrels, one containing ale and the other drinking water, stand beneath the shelves. Area U12 The Privy this privy has a toilet and wash basin, both attached to pipes. Above the basin is a hinged mirror, behind which is a compartment containing soap and towels. Area U13 Air System The door to this area is locked. A plaque on the door reads, Air System, in common and gnomish. The room has the following features. The area is filled with machines that hiss, whir and clatter constantly. The drawers in the walls contain screwdrivers, wrenches and other tools. To port and starboard, three foot high, two and a half foot wide passageways lead deeper into the machinery. Creatures that are medium or larger must squeeze to move through these passages. Machinery The quasi-magical machinery in this area generates and circulates fresh air throughout the submarine. A detect magic spell or similar magic reveals an aura of conjuration magic throughout the area. A character who has proficiency with tinkerer's tools can use them to disable the machinery with a successful DC-25 intelligence check. The same check reactivates the disabled machinery. Whether it succeeds or fails, each check represents 10 minutes of work. The machinery can also be destroyed. It has an armor class of 16, with 50 hit points and immunity to poison and psychic damage. When this machinery shuts down, air stops pumping throughout the vessel. Unless the air system is reactivated, creatures trapped in the submarine that need oxygen to breathe will begin to suffocate after two days, as described in Chapter 8 of the Player's Handbook under Suffocating. Suffocating A creature can hold its breath for a number of minutes equal to 1 plus its constitution modifier with a minimum of 30 seconds. When a creature runs out of breath or is choking, it can survive for a number of rounds equal to its constitution modifier with a minimum of one round. At the start of its next turn, it drops to zero hit points and is dying and can't regain hit points or be stabilized until it can breathe again. For example, a creature with a constitution of 14 can hold its breath for three minutes. If it starts suffocating, it has two rounds to reach air before it drops to zero hit points. Special Events You can use one or more of the following events if the characters take an interest in the Sea Maiden's Fair. The Friendly Dragon In the water ahead, a large shape speeds towards you. As it gets closer, you recognize it as a dragon with bronze-colored scales. Slewing to a stop, the creature gives a toothy grin, then raises a claw in a small wave. Well met, it chirps. Zelophan a young bronze dragon recently moved into Deepwater Harbor. It has spent the past several months scouring wrecks at the bottom of the harbor for treasure. 
and stashing precious baubles in a hidden underwater cave. Recently, he's noticed a strange craft mounted on the underside of the eye catcher. His attempts to treat with the crew have met with no success, but he's curious to know more. Since the characters appear to be headed towards a rendezvous with the eye catcher, Zella Farm would like them to find out all they can about the underwater vessel without raising suspicion. The dragon promises to meet them again after they have completed their mission. In exchange for information, he offers to give the party a barnacle covered chest that he found recently. He hasn't opened it yet, so its contents are unknown to him, but he can smell gold inside. Zelophan approaches the characters again as they leave the eye catcher. If they tell him more about the contents of the submarine, and he believes that they're being truthful, he gives them the promised reward, an old chest with a rusted lock that can be busted or pried open with a successful DC-13 strength athletics check. It contains 300 silver pieces, plus a golden amulet shaped like an octopus with amethyst eyes, worth 250 gold pieces. A secret compartment in the chest lid can be found with a successful DC-11 wisdom perception check. It contains a stoppered wooden scroll tube that holds a spell scroll of revivify. A night to remember. If the characters stake out the ships of the Sea Maiden's Fair, they observe strange activity going on the pier during their first night of surveillance. A thick fog unexpectedly rises along the water engulfing the vessels and docks alike. As the grey miasma thickens, the creaking sound of shifting ships becomes increasingly haunting. Suddenly, you spot three shadows gliding through the gloom like elves slipping through a forest. Where they came from and where they're going, you don't know. The shadowy figures are the three drow gunslingers, Felrek Lafine, Kreb Masklier, and Solon Zindabras. If any of these drow are dead or otherwise indisposed, Replace them with drow elite warriors. The drow use the cover of the fog to come ashore in one of the eye catcher's rowboats. The boat is tied off at the end of a pier between the Heartbreaker and the Hellraiser. These Bragandirth spies are on their way to a secret meeting with Lairil Silverhand. The open lord is waiting for them in an alley in the dock ward, under the cloak of an invisibility spell. She remains invisible for the entire meeting. Harper spies in Luskin recently warned Lairul that Jalaxel might be in Waterdeep. She reached out to him with a sending spell to arrange this meeting, in hopes of finding out his plans. The characters can follow the drow spies to the rendezvous. If the drow realize they're being followed, they make no effort to shake their pursuers. If they're attacked, they scatter and try to complete their mission before heading back to the eye catcher. If a battle erupts and escape seems impossible, the drow fight to the death. A city watch patrol consisting of six veterans arrives 1d4 minutes later to make arrests. Jalaxel's letter. One of the Bregendirth spies carries a letter for Lairul. It bears the wax seal of Luskin and is written in Jalaxel's elegant hand in Elvish. It reads as follows. To her ageless majesty, Lairul Silverhand, the witch queen of Stortina, lady of the north. She of the Seven Sisters, chosen of Mistra, and open lord of Waterdeep. Your spies are to be commended. Rest assured my presence in your fair city is purely recreational, if fortune smiles upon me. This visit could benefit us both. Your predecessor left the City of Splendors in a sorry state, but you have done wonders to lift the spirit of the citizenry during your short time in office. I know how politics offends you, so forgive me for taking this opportunity to point out the obvious. We can make both our cities stronger and strike back at he who robbed Water Davians of their wealth and dignity. I'm speaking, of course, of that dirty sack of rats, De Galt Neverember. That's the phrase you used to describe him yesterday to the emissary of Mirabar, is it not? Evidently, my spies are also to be commended. Why let Neverember get away with his crimes against Luskin and Waterdeep? Can we be allies, if not friends? These are the questions that haunt my dreams, as surely as I haunt yours. Sincerely, J. Lairul isn't surprised that Jalaxel lacks the courage to meet her in person. 
She thanks the drow messengers for delivering the letter and cautions them to mind the city watch and the city guard and heads back to the palace of Waterdeep. The drow spies return whence they came. Conversation with Lairul If Lairul becomes aware of the characters, she appears before them and asks them what business they have with Bregan Dearth. If the characters have not met the open lord before, she might impress them with her plain-spoken manner and lack of pretense. Alone and outside the political maelstrom, she acts more like an adventurer than a city official. If the characters inquire about the letter, she shows it to them and asks their opinions on Luskins joining the Lord's Alliance. In her mind, Luskin is a greedy pirate state that can't be trusted under any circumstances. If the characters feel similarly, she trusts them enough to ask for their help in finding and securing Lord Neverember's hidden cache of dragons. In exchange, she promises them a 5,000 gold piece reward and Waterdeep's gratitude. Day of Wonder Parade The Day of Wonders is the grandest parade of the fall season, and Jalaxel wants the Sea Maiden's Fair to be a part of it. In the guise of Zada's sword, he pays a visit the day before the holiday to the House of Inspired Hands, Waterdeep's Temple of Gond, to coordinate with the Acolytes in charge of organising the parade. He presents a detailed plan that commingles the attractions of the Sea Maiden's Fair with the bizarre inventions of the Temple, a plan that is well received. The evening before the Day of Wonders, workers begin assembling the wagons and floats of the Sea Maiden's Fair on the pier. Early the following morning, the docks are a hive of activity as performers practice their routines and caged creatures are offloaded one by one. An hour before high sun, on this crisp and windy autumn day, the Sea Maiden's Fair makes its way to the House of Inspired Hands to meet up with Gond worshippers and their contraptions. From there, the parade strikes out in earnest, marching through the water-deep streets to the cheers of the local folk. Zardos Zord serves as Grand Marshal, leading the parade on the back of a rainbow-feathered diatrima summoned using his Feather of Diatrima Summoning. Feather of Diatrima Summoning. Wondrous item, rare, requires attunement. This bright plume is made from a feather of a diatrima, a large, colourful, flightless bird native to the Underdark. If you use an action to speak the command word and throw the feather into a large, unoccupied space on the ground within five feet of you, the feather becomes a living diatrima for up to six hours, after which it reverts to its feather form. It reverts to a feather form early if it drops to zero hit points, or if you use an action to speak the command word again while touching the bird. When the Ditrima reverts to its feather form, the magic of the feather can't be used again until seven days have passed. The Ditrima uses the statistics of an axe beak, except that its beak deals piercing damage instead of slashing damage. The creature is friendly to you and your companions, and can be used as a mount. It understands your languages, and obeys your spoken commands. If you issue no commands, the diatrima defends itself but takes no other actions. For Jalaxel, the parade is a chance to show off and be cheered. He has no ulterior motive for participating in the event. While the boss is away. As the Sea Maiden's Fair parades through Waterdeep, the characters can slip aboard one or more of Jalaxel's ships. If things turn violent aboard the ship, its captain uses a sending spell to contact Jalaxel. Jalaxel is supremely confident that his crews can overcome any threat, so he doesn't rush to their defense at the first sign of trouble. Only if the characters do considerable damage will he treat their attack as a setback. If the characters escape a confrontation on the ships, but leave behind witnesses that can identify them, it takes Bregan Durth several days to track them down, assuming Jalaxel hasn't already met them. Although killing the characters would be easy at that point, Jalaxel would rather put them to work for him. He has them watched, but doesn't provoke hostilities until such time as the reward clearly outweighs the risk. Escaped Bear The Sea Maiden's Fair Parade ends where it started, at the docks. As the attractions are being loaded back into the ships, the fair's polar bear gets loose, 
fleeing into the dock ward before its handlers can corner it. News of the escaped bear spreads quickly and sightings are frequent. If the characters impress one of the drow ship captains, he contacts them by way of a sending spell and asks them for help. He wants the bear retrieved before the city guard finds it and kills it, offering a reward of either 250 gold pieces or a potion of water breathing. The characters can track and corner the polar bear with a successful DC-16 intelligence investigation or wisdom survival check. Whether the check succeeds or fails, each attempt represents one hour of searching. If the characters find the bear within four hours, it can be lured back to the Sea Maiden's Fair with food or a successful DC-14 wisdom animal handling check. The captain then makes good on the promised reward. If the characters don't find the bear, members of the city guard get to it first and kill it.